drive. Second. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the April 23rd, 2013 Wikibon Peer Insight Research Meeting, where business technology peers meet to solve challenging problems. I'm your host and moderator, Dave Vellante, and today we have a timely and interesting topic. Software is eating the world. The question is, will Amazon eat IT infrastructure? This is our first ever bi-coastal peer insight. I'm here at the Wikibon offices in Massachusetts, and today we're joined by my colleagues at the brand new SiliconANGLE studios in Palo Alto, California. And we are broadcasting live from both coasts. You can watch on SiliconANGLE.TV and SiliconANGLE.com. Jason Mendenhall is here. Jason is Executive Vice President of Cloud at Switch, creator of the SuperNaps. Jason is a cloud expert and supports the strategies and execution plans of the 500 service providers and customers who, who use the SuperNaps. Uh, welcome, Jason. Uh, can you hear me? 500 service providers and customers who. Hello, Jason. Are you there? So. Joining Jason is uh, David Floyer, uh, who is also in our studios. David, can we have a, have a sound check, please? Guys, we can't hear you. You may be on mute. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, there we go. How about now? That's good. Thank you, guys. All right. All right, good. Okay, we're running. The old phone works. Uh, so you now you can listen in on the phone line or watch live on TV. There's a slight delay to the TV stream, so if you want to watch it online, I'd recommend that you cut the volume on your phones. Uh, also, other than Jason and David for now, please mute your lines unless you're speaking, and we will give everybody a chance to do so. Now let me set up the, the premise for this call, if I may. Last year, Wikibon estimates that Amazon's AWS generated just under $2 billion in revenue and is expected to create roughly $3 billion in 2013. Its attack on the traditional enterprise suppliers has been well documented and the posture that AWS has taken toward incumbent infrastructure vendors has been extremely aggressive. The bottom line is Amazon is getting very serious about enterprise IT as a service. Now, on the one hand, this is great news for customers because Amazon has certainly popularized the cloud concept and is creating more competition. On the other hand, Amazon is pressuring IT organizations to respond. And while some Wikibon practitioners tell us that they are moving lock, stock, and barrel to AWS, others say they don't want to put all their eggs in the AWS basket because it's often too expensive and too risky. Competing cloud service providers, on the other hand, are also on the move. One only has to observe the activities of last week's OpenStack Summit to see the momentum building in cloud. HP is betting the farm on OpenStack. IBM, VMware, EMC, Oracle, and virtually every other enterprise IT player is either competing or partnering with Amazon or both. We're going to talk about these and other issues today. Uh, let me start again with Jason Mendenhall. Welcome to the Cube and welcome to the Peer Insight. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So Jason, uh, let's start off with, uh, with Switch and SuperNAP. A lot of our community is familiar with you guys, but why don't you start with a little bit about who you guys are and, and how we got here. Well, uh, Switch is the world's best data center, so we'll just start there. We'll kind of build from that story, but um, we've built a unique technology ecosystem that kind of starts with the data center, layer in an extremely robust fiber connectivity network um, as a result of our acquisition of the Enron Broadband Peering Arbitrage Data Center, um, and then expand that so that that ecosystem goes above and beyond just one facility, but multiple facilities in a technology campus that will expand to 2.2 million square feet of data center space, making it really the largest technology ecosystem in the world. Um, that connectivity and layer on it a myriad of cloud services. About uh, three years ago when we headed down the path of cloud computing, 
what we decided to do was that there wasn't going to be one cloud it was going to meet everybody's need which is you know uh, important for the topic today but that there would be multiple clouds people would have multiple workloads they would have multiple reasons why they would need to use cloud services and so what we started to do was consolidate and aggregate all of those cloud service providers under one physically secure umbrella the switch supernet the most connected the one that can handle the most density, the one that can handle the largest scale, so that our enterprise customers can put their private infrastructure in the data center and they can fully realize hybrid hybrid cloud. And so it's a unique technology infrastructure. You know, at the end of the day, we, uh, we write applications that end up on machines, that travel over networks, that, that end up on servers and storage that sits in the data center. Whether that's in a cloud or over someone's private infrastructure, that has to have a home. And I think uh, one of the things we've done is created a great home for that. So, Jason, where are we with respect to cloud today? Um, I know you talk to uh, a lot of a lot of customers, a lot of service provider partners. Uh, you know, I've always said that the the downturn in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, precipitated a movement to cloud. Uh, maybe you know, certainly for economic reasons, but I think it seems like there are other drivers to cloud. Can you talk about? those drivers and where we are today in terms of cloud adoption and, and the maturity of the infrastructure? Yeah, I, I think it's an, I think, uh, um, let's see, what's the best way to describe it? When we, when we think, when I think about cloud today, I think we're kind of in the VHS mode, right? If you were following videos, um, right now we're about the, the adoption of VHS. There's a lot of people that are, that are using it. There's a lot of people that have been experimenting with it, but we're still on cloud kind of 1.0. Um, enterprises are really starting to look at this. And um, although we have a lot of the early adopters who've taken scale, with, there are a lot of large companies that have experimented with it. They've identified what they're going to do with it. They've identified how they're going to tackle it. And for some of them, it means continuing to use public cloud. Uh, for some of them, it means incorporating that into their own private cloud deployments. For some of it, it might mean um, a, a mix of the two. We're still, I think we're still in the early phases of this, though. We're still very early on. Um, even though we see that the scale that we're operating at, and one of the at, one of the things that we have a visibility into is what all these enterprises are doing and how they're adopting not just uh, you know public cloud, but also what they're doing in their private cloud environments. And so it's that mix of the two that are becoming an interesting play for the enterprise. And from my perspective, I still think we're on the very early stages of this. When you say the mix of the two, you're talking about the mix of of private and and public or or so-called hybrid. Yeah, exactly. The mix of the two. Yep. So, in the early days of cloud, uh, a lot of uh, IT practitioners f felt that that was a pejorative. They said, you know, what's different about cloud? It's just, it's really, you know, virtualization. And a lot of organizations, as you well know, have, you know, virtualized their IT infrastructure. Um, but, but generally speaking, they were somewhat negative to the cloud. That sentiment is 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 changing, seemingly. What types of applications are organizations? putting in the cloud? I know it's a spectrum, but take us through that lineup. Well, I think we see, you know, and when I talk to folks about cloud, I think it's important to break it down into two models, right? There's cloud, the operating model, which is what we've done forever. Um, you know, we've always taken applications workloads and we push them off to someone else in a managed environment. Uh, I actually, when, I, when we talk about cloud, we tend to talk about cloud, the technology, as opposed to just the operating model, which means you're building new application, you're, you're creating environments that can optimize the cloud platforms. They're optimized to run on the cloud platforms. And so the work type of workloads that we're seeing right now, you know, it, it's not just hosted virtualization, which is a it's, a it's a form of cloud, but it's not true cloud computing on the technology level. And so what, what enterprises are really starting to do now is the type of workloads we're seeing move into the cloud are these web 2.0, web 3.0, some of the new applications where they're re-architecting the code they're writing the applications in a different way so that those applications can auto-scale and auto-shrink based upon leveraging cloud technology. It isn't just about, um, let me get it, let me get you know my mess for less somewhere else, which is where cloud operating models and sometimes cloud platforms have been in the past. Now it's more about uh, looking at it from a strategic standpoint. What can I do, what can I do to leverage that public cloud platform and then what can I do with my, you know, with my web front end, with my applications that have to auto scale? What about mobile applications on that environment? What about big data um, and analytics? And how does that have a play in that environment? And each of them are looking at it in a very different way. And it goes above and beyond now. I think where we're at is 
the innovative enterprises are looking above and beyond just hosted virtualization, which is where we've been in the past with cloud. And now they're looking at leveraging cloud the technology to really change and transform the way they develop new applications, the way they deploy those new applications, and the agility that they get as a result of taking advantage of that. And, I, and that's when, I, when we talk about being in the early stages, that's where I think I feel the story sits, is in those early stages right now. So how, uh, how can you add some color to how people are redesigning their applications generally, and specifically their business processes? What kind of effect are you seeing the cloud have on, on those two factors in some detail? Yeah, so the, we, you know, a great example, let's talk about healthcare, for instance. Uh, we, we've got one customer we've spoken to around in the, in the healthcare arena, and they had an interesting model. You know, here, here is the highly compliant, highly secure, very concerned about public cloud, very concerned about how they're going to tackle that issue. You know, they don't really want their workloads being out in the public environment yet. They really don't want them in multi-tenant spaces. And so one of the unique aspects we've been, uh, what we were able to do for them and what they, what we saw them do in our environment is they created a small inter-cloud exchange of sorts in their own private environment. So think about that for a second. What they realized is that, okay, we've got some applications that are back office IT. You know, they, they run on VMware. Right? They run on the old virtualization models, or they run on dedicated gear. And then we've got some applications that um, are kind of front end. They reach out to the end customer. They're web 2.0, they're web 3.0. And we've got to be able to scale those applications at, at a certain way. And the platforms that, that run, those run on, they're very different. And then we've got storage that's got to grow. And then we have a, a healthcare application. So, so rather than them looking at it and saying, yeah, we're going to put all this stuff into these public clouds, what, what they did is they brought the clouds into their environment and created a platform with a multi-vendor approach within, that, within their own private environment. And what they, what they gathered out of that was a really unique tool set of their own kind of myriad of inter-cloud exchange, myriad of cloud services, where they could take advantage of every one of those opportunities. Um, that's where we're seeing kind of some of these highly resilient, highly compliant, um, highly regulated industries sort of tackle the issue. It is adopt some of these public or public technologies, but bring them into a private environment. And then we've got other folks that when they look at big data, you know, uh, they're actually saying, look, we, you know, and, and when we talk about big data, we separate it out into two areas. We talk about the big data where you go into someone else's environment, like a Twitter or a Facebook or um, you know, Google and you mine their information, that's one type. The real, mo the real money exists in people taking advantage of their own data. And what they're looking to now is they're saying, look, I've got all this data, but for me to build the high performance compute infrastructure to do the analysis on this, it's extremely challenging. And so what we're seeing people do is take those workloads, move them into cloud platforms for the analysis, and then bringing the data back after they've got their, after they've got the story told. Um, and then there's the traditional, you know, uh, front end user based uh, applications that need to auto scale, um, that need to be able to reach out to the end user, and they need to be able to hit multiple, uh, multiple geos and multiple regions. And when something occurs, when there's a, a big burst, they need to be able to handle that at scale. And, the, and we've got customers in the web 2.0, web 3.0 space that are taking advantage of those tools as well. So it really, it, when you when you look at the spectrum, I think it's still across the board. It's still in every aspect, and I, I think we're at a stage of cloud now where people aren't asking why cloud. They're starting to ask which cloud, which ties in directly to a little bit of what we're talking about today. Yeah, excellent, and uh, we're about 15 minutes into the call, and as, as the folks who are familiar with Peer Insights know, we will give you an opportunity to, to, to chime in, and I'm sure there are many questions. Uh, before we open it up, though, Jason, I want to get directly into the, you know, the substance of this call. You heard my... Oh, but, if I may, I ask folks to please mute your line. Somebody's making a lot of noise. We've got a wind tunnel going on. So star six if you don't have a mute button. Um, just a little background noise there. Thank you. Um, so still got some background noise, please, uh, if you don't mind muting your line there. One rogue line. Um, I'll go in and start muting if I have to. But um, Jason, I, I wanted to ask you about AWS specifically. You heard my wrap up front. Is, is AWS uh, an unstoppable train? My colleague John Furrier, when I wrote the piece on Amazon Gorilla in the enterprise, John said, you know, Dave, that's interesting you call them a gorilla, but it's the first time that, that, that I can think of, this is John Furrier speaking, that 
the gorilla, the incumbent, was actually the disruptor. They're moving faster than everybody else. They're dropping, dropping prices faster. They're, they're innovating faster. What are your, what's your take on Amazon? How, is, uh, how are, are, are your clients competing with Amazon, and are they just unstoppable? I don't, I don't necessarily think that they're unstoppable. I think they definitely have a place in the market, but we, we've talked about how, um, how it's no, no longer the question is why cloud, it's which cloud. And Amazon's going to have an important play for um, every, you know, every enterprise is probably going to be looking to them at some point. But when you think about what they've done and where they're at, yes, they were the disruptor, and yes, they've grown, you know, they're going to continue to grow. They've grown at, a, at, an, at an amazing rate. And they've been able to add service points, you know, points of service where people can consume lots of different types of things. But their platform isn't going to be for everyone, and it won't be for every workload. There is not going to be one cloud to rule them all. You know, when, when we look at um, some of the things that are overlooked by the enterprises when they look at Amazon, as they, as, they, as they dip into it, right? A lot of folks have been dipping their toe into the water and figuring out what it is. Um, all of a sudden, what they find out is the network is one of the most overlooked aspects of cloud computing. And they're going, wait a second, we forgot that all this data has got to move from point A to point B. Um, hybrid models, you know, that we've talked about already. When they get into Amazon, they're thinking about how do these, how do, how do I do hybrid in this, in this platform? How do I manage this? How do I control each of, these, each of the elements of this application? Security you know, becomes an issue. The location of the cloud is a question that they're starting to ask around that. You know, think about the data center. I mean, I, I think that's one of the most overlooked aspects of cloud computing. Your data ends up sitting somewhere, and the cloud is only as good as the infrastructure it's running on. And who knows where some of that infrastructure is? You know, you wouldn't want to be in a data center you wouldn't want your infrastructure, your your cloud services, your data sitting in a data center that, I don't know, had something stupid like a wood roof built on it, right? You you don't want to be in an environment that's got something like that going on. Um, and so you end up you end up seeing that there, I think Amazon will have a place. They're not going to go away. Um, people said mainframe would be dead one day. I don't think Amazon Cloud's going to be dead ever. They're going to continue to grow, and they'll have a place in the enterprise. But we're starting to see customers who are saying, you know what, I need an alternative. There needs to be two vendors in the market. I can't just have Amazon because cost is becoming an issue. Support is becoming an issue on the Amazon platform. Um, performance is really starting to be something that people are looking at. It has limitations to its platform. And then control. How do I control each of those environments? And so we've seen a wave of competitors that have been coming up, and a lot of them are in our environment and some of them are elsewhere who are aggressively going after the Amazon customer set. And they're, and customers are out looking. They're looking for an alternative. They're even saying to themselves, hey, if, if cloud is everything it should be, I shouldn't have a single vendor approach to this. I should have a multi-vendor approach. And so you see folks like Joyent, uh, who is making great moves in this area, a high-performance cloud that has a better cost model. They offer the opportunity to move to private because you can take their whole cloud operating system and bring it in-house. They, they offer great scale. And a, and a competing platform, and folks like Profit Bricks, you know, the the founders of One in One Hosting, who uh, after selling the company decided they wanted to build a cloud platform in Europe. They started that. Now they they've launched in the U.S. You've got Cloud Provider USA, uh, which is a small provider but has focused on the compliant industry. Hey, we're an SSD based cloud that is PCI compliant, HIPAA compliant, and we're a great location for software as a service. And then folks like Cloud Sigma, who come in and provided a unique, flexible environment where you can auto-scale your applications and you're not stuck with certain, I don't know, pieces of, uh, of cloud compute. You're not, you're not stuck with the buckets that they prescribe to you. You actually can scale and deliver whatever you want to do on a flexible level. And then, of course, we've got HP who's making a great play. And, um, that, you know, that it's interesting. They're going to be interesting to watch because the one difference in them between all the other cloud providers is HP makes the gear. At the end of the day, cloud still runs on gear, and if I'm Amazon, I still got to buy the gear. HP makes the gear, so that I think that gives them an interesting advantage of this space. And then these are a lot of the kind of you know lamp stack uh, platform as a service guys who take advantage of Web 2.0, Web 3.0 applications. But we still can't forget the VMware clouds like BlueLock and and uh, Savas and even VMware themselves, who are really going after those enterprise applications. But still, we we can't necessarily change. And so you see this really unique blend of all of this, and then in the ecosystem of cloud, 
the software providers who are sitting up on top of all of these cloud services and providing an opportunity for them to integrate at multiple levels. And so it becomes this, uh, I, I think it's this interesting ecosystem to watch to see the role that Amazon will play and also the role that others will play. And there's going to be an opportunity for someone to be a winner there, uh, to be the alternative. And I think the, the company who seizes on that and delivers it at the best value and overcomes some of those enterprise issues that we're looking at, they'll actually be poised to be just as big, if not bigger, than Amazon. Excellent. So I want to come back to some of those points, uh, cost, performance, control, uh, talk about some of the specifics. You mentioned HP. Uh, we were at the OpenStack Summit last week, and uh, and clearly OpenStack hit a milestone. I want to talk about VMware's move, but we're 22 minutes in, and I want to just take a breath here and, and let the community uh, chime in. So the way this works, folks who aren't familiar with it, uh, just go ahead and, and, and break in. Let us know who you are. You know, uh, first name is fine if you don't want to give your whole name. And, uh, and, and just ask away, and I'll continue to moderate here. So are there any questions sp or comments specifically uh, that the folks in the community have? I'll just take a break right now and ask that. Uh, this, is, this is David Sawyer uh, here in uh, Palo Alto. Um, I've I got an observation about the uh, whole ecosystem that's being created. And in particular, what I've been very impressed with about uh, the uh, SuperNAP is your ability to create that ecosystem around particular, uh, particular um, companies. So, for example, the media companies, not too far away from you in Los Angeles. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, it, it seems to me that data should reside close to the processing. The processing should come to the data. It's very, very expensive to move large amounts of data around the place and take a long time as well. So what are you doing there to facilitate uh, the reduction in movement of data uh, for particular, particularly enterprises that actually need the same data or, or use the past data from one place to another place? Uh, it's a couple things, which is, and it's a, it's a great question. And one of the reasons that we've been going after this kind of ecosystem concept, um, because of the scale of the environment we've built, uh, it's kind of created an interesting dynamic. It, it's not about us serving a single particular um, it's not about us serving like a single particular industry, but more. Guys, we lost your um, we lost your feed, Jason. Um, I don't know if you went on mute by mistake, but um, while we're. Um, uh, Jason's just dialing in again. Okay, yeah. So while we're while while Jason's dialing back in, let me um, let me just mention to folks if you're not comfortable uh, asking a question on the line, uh, go ahead and, uh, and and tweet me. I'm at D Vellante, uh, or you can uh, you know that's probably the best way for because I'm asking the questions here. I wanted to uh, right. while while Jason's coming back in, uh, David, just give me the. I'm back know. in. Sorry oh, okay. Go ahead. No problem at all. Carry on, please. Yeah, yeah so, so one of the things, because we operate at the scale we've been able to operate, it's, it's created a, a sector, a lot of industry sectors. And when you think about you know, consolidating all of those sectors in one environment and consolidating the clouds, you have to be able to support the scale of that infrastructure to move. And so within the data center, we're creating opportunities for these industry segments to execute cloud and execute the movement of data in the way that works best for their industry. Everybody's different. You know, media is a great example. Um, we can talk about some of the things that they're doing. By, by putting their um, rendering infrastructure, by putting um, the data that they're sharing in our facility, and then taking advantage of our fiber connectivity, um, where we've got multiple carriers, and reaching out to those different markets that they service, they're able to move that data in and out much easier and then keep it there for long periods of time. You know, I think people on, in this movement of data, one of the things they're forgetting you know, when you look at a two petabyte data set, which is how some of these data sets, that's not unheard of, right? You look at a two petabyte data set, to move two petabytes over a 10 gig line takes 11 days. 
That's if everything works. It's not possible, right? So you've got to get that data and co co-locate it next to the compute. And so what we've created with the scale of the ecosystem is the opportunity for that data to move with InfiniBand speed and 100 gig and 40 gig because you're not bound by the distance limitations and the fact that you've got to pay for all of these carrier circuits. And so we're creating platforms and models based on the different industries for them to take advantage of those tool sets. And if that answers the question. I wonder... So back backhauling rather than uh, uh, hauling over the internet uh, by the back door. Now, that, that seems to be a very, very sensible model indeed. And, uh, and, and, and I think it goes beyond just the sharing. It's likely that an industry will have data streams coming into it which are unique to that industry and which they all want to share. And that you'll have data providers as part of that ecosystem within the data center as well. When Absolutely. You when you talk about uh, backhauling, are we, we talk about throwing cables over the cage. <laughs> is it is it that brute force? Talk about that a little bit. Well, it, there, there's two types. So there is the you know in essence the cable over the cage, right? We talk about cross connect within the data center. That's an important part of it. That's once the data gets there. But when you really talk about backhauling, about getting the data there and being able to store it at scale, that's a different model. And that's where um, our connectivity ecosystem actually helps our customers because one of the things we've done which is unique is rather than just saying we've got, all right, we've got a lot of providers and you can cross-connect to any one of them if you order services from them, we've consolidated the buying power of our customer base and translated that into savings for our customers. So no matter how big you are, in essence, we're bigger uh, from a buying perspective in the telecommunications space. And our, our telecommunications team has the ability to dramatically shift the total cost of ownership of the platform to, so the customers are saving you know, anywhere between 25 and 60% on their connectivity costs. So these high-capacity circuits to move the data to get it there once it's there are, are, extremely, are extremely low. And so it becomes, it becomes possible, whereas before, moving large amounts of data over these private lines and backhauling it into a location was just cost prohibitive because of the diversity of carriers and the ecosystem of buying power that we've created, we call it CORE, the Combined Ordering Retail Ecosystem, our customers are able to save so that they can actually execute these plans in a cost-effective way. If they didn't have that, it wouldn't be possible. And then as they get in the data center, and you talk about cloud services sharing with service providers and uh, customers sharing data with one another, you talk about that, then it's as simple as, yeah, the cross-connect over the fiber over the cage, but it doesn't look like that. You know. That's the idea. Jason, Jason, one of the newer, I know I'm simplifying it a bit, one of the newer uh, value propositions that Amazon puts forth is the ability to go global in minutes as they expand their footprint you know, worldwide. How do you um, meet, uh, your tenants meet that capability? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, they're, they're, doing, it, they're doing it in the same way that um, they've done it before. Um, they're leveraging, you know, even though we have these cloud providers in our facility and they're part of that cloud ecosystem, those cloud providers are building nodes across the globe. You know, we've got cloud providers who have a West Coast presence in our facility. They've got an East Coast presence maybe in uh, Napa, the, uh, you know, in, in Miami. Um, they've got a presence in Amsterdam, maybe in Zurich. You know, we've got uh, cloud providers with a presence in Asia and throughout the globe. So Amazon isn't the only provider who's actually deploying throughout the globe. Others are as well. And the nice thing is, is the, the in our facility with that with that multiple choice of cloud providers and service providers. You know, we've got over 40 cloud providers and managed service providers that can do cloud services right within the data center. All of them have a value to our customers in one way or another, and. They each have footprints in other geos and other regions, just like Amazon's going to promise that same kind of global footprint. Those cloud providers that we mentioned earlier, they're all attacking it in the same way. Okay, um, again, I'm going to open it up to folks. I've got a couple of questions on, uh, on Twitter, but let me just stop for a minute, see if anybody else has any questions. Go ahead and just jump right in. Tell us who you are. Hey, hey this is Peter Daly in Dallas. Hi, Peter. How you doing? Good to talk to you again. Oh, thank you. Uh, Jason, quick question. Um, Dave opened up the conversation with the uh, observation that Amazon was at about a $2 billion run rate in 12 and projected $3 billion in 13. Is there any way to do an apples-to-apples -apples kind of a comparison? Uh, I know pricing is different and revenue models and all that stuff are different, but, you know, kind of theory of relativity. I mean, how, how do you, um, as a collective, relate to that 2 to $3 billion in growth? 
That makes sense. Yeah, sure. yeah no, actually, I get your question. It's one that I'm actually exploring right now. You know, one of the things that we've been looking at is when you look at the collective ecosystem of cloud providers that are in our facility, which is which is probably unique than any other data center out there. Um, I don't think anybody has the scale to consolidate all these cloud providers in one location. But you asked an interesting question, one that I've been exploring, which is, what does you know what does Amazon Amazon's growth compare to the growth of the multiple service providers that we have? And uh, unfortunately, I don't have an answer right now. Um, uh, it, it, everybody's private. I think even Amazon's numbers we're all taking a guess at. Right? Uh, we're sort of prognosticating what we think it is, and you know I've heard numbers of well they're going to spin up three million VMs over the next uh, you know over the next year or some number in that category. But I do know that when it comes to processing power, when it comes to storage capability, and you and you kind of look at it all in one ecosystem, I don't think anything compares to what we have in one environment. But then when you look across the globe, how does that translate with those providers? And I'll tell you what I I will uh, I'll make this promise. I'm going to figure out an answer to that question, and then our next peer insight uh, sometime in the future, we can talk about that. Like, yeah. how does the collective compare to Amazon? That might be an interesting uh, topic. Yeah, I, I, I would love that metric. I have a question uh, from uh, Aaron Newman of Cloud Checker. He says, uh, Jason, will enterprises go straight to the public cloud, or are they going to move more slowly to, to hybrid clouds first? What do you see going on there? Here's, the, here's what we've seen. Um, they go to the public cloud just to experiment. They take their team and they go, go figure this out. And then the public, the team goes in there and they, they'll spin up some stuff in Amazon, maybe try a few workloads, try some dev and QA, maybe try some tests and some scaling capabilities, right? They'll, they'll look at that. Then what they'll do is they'll say, okay, we, we, we think we figured it out. And then there'll be some project. There'll be something that is driving this initiative. It is, you know, sometimes the CIOs and CTOs are coming in and going, we got to get to the cloud, and everyone's going, we don't even know what that means right now for us. All right, so they'll find some project that will drive that, and it will do one of two things for them. It either pushes them into a private cloud deployment, it takes them to the public cloud to try something new, or they actually choose all three, So it, or, or both of them, where they, go high, where they do a hybrid model, public and private, kind of a mixed environment. But what we're seeing is it tends to be a new project, something that kind of makes them look at the way things are differently, and they are experimenting with it differently than they have before. Most of them end up with their first foray in the cloud from what we've seen. Their first foray tends to be some kind of private deployment uh, that, that is a production environment. And I think the way they look at it, I think this is the place that Amazon's going to have for all enterprises. They'll go, awesome, I can do dev and QA over there in the Amazon cloud, but once I'm ready to, and I know exactly what I'm going to need, I'm going to bring this in-house, I'm going to put it in my private environment, and then we'll be able to run and manage it and control it at every level because we already have the teams to do it, and it's going to give us a better cost model anyway. And I think that's an interesting uh, approach that they've been taking and one that has a lot of value. You know, I wanted to mention, uh, I just mentioned Aaron Newman of Cloud Checker. So Cloud Checker is a company, so, so we, some of you might remember when Amazon basically made uh, Trusted Advisor free for the month of March. Trusted Advisor is a way for enterprises to take a look at you know, whether or not they're in compliance with best practices. And Cloud Checker did a study of, of its uh, customers, because Cloud Checker supports a AWS, and the number was enormous. It was something like two thirds or even three quarters of the, the uh, clients that they had were out of compliance in some way, shape, or form. Uh, which was uh, you know, very, uh, quite an astounding figure, but I guess not that surprising. These are configurations or you know, security settings and so forth. Um, Jason, do you see that as common in the public cloud or hybrid cloud generally, and how are your tenants uh, addressing that situation? Uh, the way they address it is they, they get out of the cloud once they figure it out. You know, we, kind of a funny, <laughs> uh, an interesting thing. We had, um, it was kind of an interesting thing. We had one customer, a highly regulated industry, who said we absolutely, and we were working with one of our cloud providers with them, and they said we absolutely do not permit any of our uh, developers to use instances in the cloud. It's not allowed, and we have nothing there. And the cloud provider said, really? Um <laughs> Here, let me share with you some of your folks that might actually be putting workloads on there. And of course, they're blown away, right? It, this is the rogue IT discussion that kind of came up earlier. Um, in our environment, a lot of the clouds are more focused around enterprise cloud. And, and although they have dabbled in uh, cloud platforms, the way they're addressing it more so in the uh, within the data center, as we've seen them tackle it, is 
they've, they've experimented and now they're getting serious about it and they're looking at how they're going to address that and they're choosing the right cloud. Again, back to the discussion, they got past the white cloud. Now they're going, wait, which cloud is right for this? And I think that's an interesting, I think that's an interesting evolution. You know, one of the security things that we've talked about, um, physical security within the cloud platform that I think CIOs and CTOs are neglecting, not only are they out of compliance, but let's take the example of my data sitting on some cloud somewhere, and, and I, won't, I won't pick on Amazon in particular, but any cloud for that instance, that isn't in the right facility. They take that data, they stripe that data across three or four servers, and if one of those servers crashes, what happens? It automatically rewrites to one of the other servers. What happened to that box that crashed? Who fixes it? Where does it go? You know, does Frank the Tech, no offense to guys named Frank, but does Frank the Tech grab that box and then go home? And then he has all the time in the world, whatever encryption you have on that data doesn't matter. How do you, how do you audit that process? And those are some of the things that I think people are talking about in an independent co-location environment where multiple cloud providers exist. You can kind of tackle those types of issues. And that's, that's the way they're looking at it. How do I really, really address this at a large scale and make sure that as I move more workloads into the cloud, how, how do I ensure compliance, auditability, and tracking in each of those areas? And then in certain cases, there's applications where it won't matter. I mean, I, um, I think one of the concerns I would have if I was starting a business today, if I, if I started putting my stuff on the Amazon cloud, is if they're going to start competing with me, right? Net a la Netflix, right? <laughs> Here I am, I use this big platform, and now they're competing with me by offering a streaming video service and new TV shows and all the magic that I deliver. Um, I think at some point you've got to find that competitive differentiator that goes above and beyond the infrastructure. Uh, we got a number of questions on Twitter and uh, uh, around pricing, but let me open it up to the community again and just see if anybody's got any questions on the phone line. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, it's just David again. I was just saying that it's also interesting to see that new applications are coming into the cloud, which are from the very get-go cloud-based. So you take something like uh, Salesforce.com or you take something like ServiceNow, which has come in like a train into a particular area and is replacing half a dozen, maybe 20 applications within a, a data center and putting them out into the cloud. So it's an opportunity for, for new business models, new applications to come in. Uh, I personally think it's going to be very unlikely that you're going to move your current applications to the cloud just to save a bit of money. That, that doesn't mean to make any sense at all. Uh, and they're not built for that type of environment. So it's, to me, it's, it's interesting to see the new applications coming in, the potential, as you said, for uh, Web3.0, all these new applications coming in and bringing in a new way of doing business. So David, you're saying these hybrids are, are an extension of the IT or, or of the business process as opposed to just simply a, a burst mechanism uh, or a, a lock, stock and barrel outsource of existing IT. Am I getting that right? That's correct. I mean, that, that is uh, useful only when you have a stateless environment. If you're trying to have a, a situation where the data is in two places, those type of birth mechanisms are very difficult to manage. So it, for, for some web applications where it's just pure web serving that you need to do, they can work very well indeed. But if you're trying to split the database between two sides uh, and get that to work, that, that's kind of tough. Uh, so. Um, uh, yes, uh, bursting for specific stateless, great bursting in general, unless you've, unless you've mapped it out very, very clearly beforehand, that's much, much tougher to do. Okay, we have 20 minutes. Uh, again, I want to open it up to the community and make sure that everybody has an opportunity here to, uh, to chime in. Any questions, comments, uh, share your perspectives, uh, experiences with the cloud? Uh, go ahead, I'll give you a second to respond. This is, uh, this is Scott Lowe, I have a question. Um, <laughs> You know, David, you mentioned that um, you know you're not necessarily seeing you know people move their legacy architectures into the cloud. But I was wondering, from the cloud provider perspective, are you seeing any interest from people uh, wanting wanting to try to make that attempt, but either finding difficulty or finding it's cost prohibitive, or or um, are, are are people um, attempting to try to find ways to reduce their on-premises environment for various reasons, with even with legacy applications like ERPs. Oh, uh, absolutely. I, I, I'm not saying that they won't put those in the cloud. They'll put those as a managed service in the cloud. 
uh, in the same way as outsourcing is worked today. So that's happening lock, stock, and barrel. And uh, it was very interesting. We did a recent uh, set of interviews with uh, with vendors, uh, with with, uh, with users, and some of those were, had a strategic objective of moving their whole data center to the cloud, and in particular to to Amazon. So uh, people are doing that. Uh, they're, they're doing their particular application into the cloud, but that they, their objective is to move the whole lot, uh, to keep the data close together. Um, and some people are then are planning to put their, to outsource their uh, legacy applications to the same data center as the other cloud services are in. So again, achieving that closeness of data. So there are a number of different models out there and a number of different ways that people are tackling it. But uh, for me, the most important thing is keeping the data close, keeping the relevant data close together and avoiding the cost of moving data. One of the biggest costs, for example, of Amazon is moving the data out of Amazon. It's free to put it in, but it's very, very expensive to take it out again. So uh, that, is, that uh, as a piece of adv a practical advice is, Plan where the data is. Plan to keep the processing close to the data. Do you, do you mean the, the temporal locality of the data, or the, or the spatial locality of the of the data in that sense? Did you hear that question? Say that again. Did your airport? Say it again. Uh, sorry, it's a uh, Rob from New York. Um, do you mean the the temporal locality of the data? That is, data is typically accessed within the same uh, same period of time, or the uh, you know in the more um, type of data um, sense. The, the the physical proximity to move that as, 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 Jason was, as Jason was explaining to move a petabyte of data takes uh, weeks uh, across even the largest uh, enterprise and, and it's very very expensive. So if you're if you're aiming to optimize the geographical proximity of data wow. and processing, uh, what have you found is the most useful metric for it for deciding what to put um, what to put where? Um, uh, the, 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 the optimizing on your networking cost is uh, the clearest, uh, clearest oh, uh, the, the cost of doing processing, the cost of Apparently. storing data is about the same wherever you are. The cost of the networking of that data is optimizing on that. So let's, uh, let's we're we'll getting a little background noise, David. Let me just sort of summarize the question. We're talking about uh, the movement of data as a barrier to cloud, the physical movement of data and the size of the, the data being problematic. And, and the question Rob asked, what's the metric that you want to optimize? And you're saying the metric is the, the network costs. Did I, did I hear that correctly? And, and please carry on and add some Net color to that. Uh, network costs and uh, the elapsed time for that movement of data. Those are the two metrics that you have to build in. Can you afford can you afford uh, the amount of time to send it across the network? Um, and uh, uh, can you afford the, the networking cost? It, it, it's just a, a, a practical issue, and the more that big data is coming in and more that companies uh, within the same uh, industry are sharing data, the more important it will be to essentially use mega data centers to op optimize or, or minimize the uh, cost of transmitting data. And Jason, Did you were arguing opportunities for moving the uh, the code and shifting the uh, computation rather than shifting the data itself. Yeah, so Rob is, Rob, is that's a great point. You're talking about f shipping five megabytes of, of f code or function as opposed to moving, you know, a terabyte of data, and that's you know clearly the sort of new paradigm that we've seen with with Hadoop. Um, any other comments or thoughts on that, David or Jason, before we move on to another question? Uh, I know I think it's covered really well. I think um, I think the other layer to add on to that is really the idea of how, um, you know, not just how are you moving your workloads around, but then where are you do what are you doing with that data after you're done with it? Because what we're seeing, one of the mistakes we, we think people are doing is they distribute their data, they distribute their workloads, they end up leaving the data out there. They don't bring it back to a central location where they can actually then start to do the analysis because like we talked about earlier with big data platforms, the real value is going to be the data that you own. And it's not about the questions you know to ask today, it's, it's what you don't know. It's what you want to ask tomorrow. And getting that data back to a place where your compute 
and the and the analysis of that can do can be done. So you're seeing one of the things we're seeing is people architect applications differently, right? They're creating these, you know, almost like client like operating models uh, for the applications in a small amount of data that report back to a central repository where it can be stored and it can be operated at scale. And then that becomes their historical archive. But the transactional piece sits out there. And there's some, there's, a, I, there's some interesting dynamics occurring in the space right now that are actually really fun to watch. I, I, I think I have the best job on earth. Maybe, <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has it's the same way, but I, it, it's a ton of fun to get to see all the things that people are doing. We've got uh, about 13 minutes. Uh, there's some ground I want to cover. I want to definitely bring in uh, John Furrier and have he have him and David Floyer talk a little bit about the OpenStack Summit, John, if you're still on. And uh, I've got some questions on Twitter as well on pricing. but. Uh, another chance for the community, if you have any questions specific to, for Jason or comments on your own cloud experiences or advice for your fellow peers, please uh, chime in. Hi, this is uh, Jeff Kelly. Um, Jason, I wonder if I could just push back a little bit on something you mentioned about uh, some of the real value of big data uh, being in the, in, in the data that you as an enterprise already own. Um, you know, I would, I would suggest that maybe it's, it's certainly that's uh, a lot of value there in terms of bringing together disparate data within your own uh, internal enterprise. But I think when you really start to combine that with outside data sources, whether it's market data, social data, whatever the case may be, that's where you can really start to get some, uh, um, do some analytics and find some insights that can really be key differentiators. And it seems to me that the cloud is actually a good, good uh, place to do that kind uh, of workload as a lot of that third-party data, of course, doesn't exist in your own data center anyway, and it may not be something you want to keep in perpetuity. So perhaps the cloud is a good area to do that kind of integration and uh, bringing in disparate data sources from inside and outside the enterprise. Um, kind of what's your take on that? And, and, and further, uh, speaking of big data in terms of privacy and security, what are some of the, the implications there uh, that you might be hearing from some of your uh, clients? No, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, right? That value of, I, I think it's the marrying of the two, right? We, we, and, and the reason I mentioned it earlier, we're seeing customers that are saying, yeah, I go out and I do stuff with other people's data and I get value with that, but they are not marrying it with their own yet. And to the point you made, the value in, in, in these analytics platforms now and in the future will be, how do I marry what I know with what is publicly available out there? And to the point that David was making, you know, in a, in a large scale environment, in a data center environment like, um, like we're seeing and what we've been, what we've created, there now is the opportunity for the public data that is publicly available and your private data to kind of be in facility. And so what that starts to what that starts to look like is some of the security issues that you're that are concerned about when you start to marry your data with public data and then shove it somewhere else to do a workload. All of those security issues, at least from a physical standpoint, get to be removed and even from a connectivity standpoint. You know, we have customers that are patching into publicly available data sets um, and marrying it with their own private data and then doing analysis and they're never leaving the data center. That's kind of an interesting model, and they never had to transfer over the internet, and they didn't even have to transfer over, public, you know, uh, over uh, private point-to-point -point lines. It was literally just fiber cross connects within the data center. And I think you make you you make excellent points about how how big data is going to see evolve. Now, on what our customers are talking about when it talks about security of moving some of these big data analytics into the cloud, what they are worried about is kind of the point we made before. If I bring a bunch of data into someone's environment and I do analysis on that in their environment and then I move it out, how, how do I how am I ensure that that data is gone? And so there's a there's an interesting mix of things going on where they're they're saying my data will sit here, my compute will be over there, and I will leverage the compute, but I'm not going to move my data into the workload. And so that's possible when you're in the same facility. When the when your data sits somewhere and the compute cloud sits somewhere else entirely, that's not necessarily possible. And so there is this powerful uh, concept of a big data ecosystem that's actually evolving in front of our eyes as well. And we're driving it to a certain extent, I mean, for, uh, for all the good reasons that our customers want and for that the market is demanding. But you, you hit the nail on the head when it comes to uh, big data and all the issues around it. Um, let's talk a little bit about OpenStack. Uh, OpenStack Summit last week kind of hit a milestone. Uh, John Furrier, when OpenStack came out, said, uh, it's a Hail Mary uh, against Amazon. I think he was right about that. Uh, be interested, John, if, if whether or not you think the Hail Mary connected. Uh, you've got Grizzly coming out. Uh, looks good. Looks like they're embracing things like ESX and Hyper-V. At the same time, you've got companies like VMware and IBM and, and EMC and certainly HP uh, uh, getting behind OpenStack. 
Uh, John, I'm not sure if you're still on the call. If you are, I'd love your, your thoughts. And if not, maybe David Floyer can chime in a little bit because you were at the OpenStack Summit as well. I'm here. Great. I'm so here. what's your take on uh, OpenStack as it relates to this conversation, John? Yeah, I think this is a great conversation. I think uh, Jason mentioned, uh, you know, Amazon. And, you know, to me, OpenStack really is accelerated by a couple factors. One is um, the community recognizes that the freight train is coming down the track in Amazon in the sense that, you know, as I said, Dave, on the Cube uh, a while back, is, you know, it's rare you see a company like Amazon do, you know, two things. And anytime you see a company succeeding, it's usually one of two things. They're commoditizing an existing marketplace, and, and that's their core value proposition. On the other hand, a company might differentiate on value and be a, an enabler, an innovator, um, and that's their value proposition. It's very rare that you see a company do both at the same time. And I think what Amazon demonstrated is that they are out to commoditize the infrastructure at the infrastructure as a service level and at the platform as a service level, and that's really a core value proposition. At the same time, they're enabling massive disruption and innovation at the developer level and then DevOps, and ultimately eliminating ops. They're essentially killing DevOps at the same time. So that is scaring the hell out of everybody, and that's fundamentally causing the big guys to realize that they're under threat and they have time on their side. So you're seeing everyone snap into line. You're seeing things like what Jason's doing at Switch and the Super Nap in Vegas, really driving the, the, the standard for what people want. They want the infrastructure elastic. They want to manage workloads. It's an application-centric model with, with big data applications or you know mobile applications or whatever application, SaaS, the SaaSification. So clearly OpenStack is the answer to give enterprises the ability to do their own cloud and build fast. And the fact that it's open source and scale out really is a testament to one of some of the things we've been covering and the topics that are most interested by the alpha geeks is how do I build open source based code, code scale out infrastructure? And so OpenStack is the beginning of that journey. And still not baked out, but certainly, you know, the work that HP's done there has been, been awesome and Rackspace obviously getting a big halo effect. So you know, the event was fantastic. It was high signal, uh, not a lot of noise, a lot of developers, a lot of interest from the enterprise and service providers. So I would say it was a fantastic event. But again, you know, not even top of the first inning, and it's, it's a good sign in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's clear that most of the activity in terms of deployments for OpenStack is with the service provider community, even though uh, OpenStack uh, gave some, the community gave some good examples, Comcast, Best Buy, others. Uh, but cloud service providers are clearly picking up on this. It's almost as though you, know, you got, you know, the public cloud guys, you've got the private cloud guys, and OpenStack is really sort of, you know, filling that void in the middle. A question on Twitter, Jason, you mentioned HP before, uh, really, you know, owning or developing its own infrastructure and using that for the cloud. Question around pricing. How far can, you know, pricing come down on infrastructure, and uh, is this going to lead to this notion of a software-defined, or what Wikibon calls a software-led infrastructure environment? Uh, it, it's, it's interesting to, the nice thing is we, we get to watch this space and we go, oh great, here goes the race to zero, right? <laughs> um, and then the question is, will it bounce, right? Will it go down and then will it bounce? Will, will people realize, look, this isn't sustainable at some point? I think where you're going to see uh, people hold their pricing is on the value that they're going to deliver. Yeah, you're going to have Amazon doing commoditize and continually to ratchet down pricing each month after month, right, in, in the way that they've been doing it. But then you're going to have others come in and go, yep, ours is a little bit more, but you're not going to pay for this, and you're not going to pay for that, and you're going to be able to get the following extra benefits. And so I think people will differentiate, which we've seen uh, forever in that, in that space. HP, I think, uh, you know, in tying them into uh, what they're doing with cloud and even with what they're doing with OpenStack, I think is kind of an interesting one to watch. Um, yeah, you know, I like watching Dave, what I would, they're doing. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I would, Dave, I would agree with Jason on that, is that you look at the commoditization. You know, I, I once called Amazon the junkyard cloud where you come and build your own car, build your own, you know, cloud. They've gotten so much better and they're doing so many new announcements, it's really fast. However, you look at what HP is doing, for instance, what Jason's talking about, that's the value play. The value play here is to give the, the same functionality and differentiate on that different value. Value is dealing with legacy apps, dealing with workloads. There's a lot of details that quite frankly, aren't being field for a lot of the enterprise, meaning that they just can't turn key cloud the way you can do on the public cloud. So there's a nuance there, and I think OpenStack speaks to that. You're seeing some of the major initiatives that at least I'm seeing and CIOs that I talk to, Dave, saying the same thing. Hey, you know what? 
I have NetApp here. I have EMC Drive. I have all this stuff. I got to make it work. Now, I might throw away it over time, but right now I'm not going to just trash everything and just move right to a pure cloud environment. So I think it's important to understand that the value side is really relevant in, in the enterprise for those, for those type of workloads. Yeah, and, and you know, on, and what we're seeing too is as we see the evolution of OpenStack, I think it's going to give enterprises some tool sets, tools that they're looking for. I mean, I'll, I'll, we've got one customer who is a very large scale, you know, they actually uh, provide a service to the customers. They're a service provider, but they're not an infrastructure service provider. They, uh, they, they develop a web scale platform that allows small businesses to take advantage of, of the, of tools and software that they kind of present to them from merchant services, you name it, right? So that, their end customer has no idea what they're using behind the scenes. They just want the stuff to work. And they have thousands and thousands of customers. So managing the infrastructure is actually a big challenge for them. And they decided not too long ago to just standardize on OpenStack. They run their infrastructure with OpenStack to deliver their service. And their journey has been not without its speed bump, but they've been able to execute, and they're doing very well at it. But even with the OpenStack framework, you know, they're finding that they've got hardware that doesn't have drivers to, to support OpenStack. It doesn't, you know, we're back to the same discussion, right? It is a new operating system, and I think that's what, kind of what we're seeing. We're seeing new operating systems come about that will have a different name besides Windows and, and uh, iOS and Linux. You know, there'll, there'll be some of the same players, but it's going to be a new operating system. And that's the way we've been looking at it. Yeah, I just read on uh, Silicon Angle that the... Uh, well. just, coming at a very fast rate, Havana is coming six months later, and the if anything, an increasing rate yes. uh, of uh, development of those new platforms. All right, folks, we're out of time. I, to, to the last point, I just read on Silicon Angle the uh, the Mozilla OS phone is out. So yes, to the to the new OSs and and new models. Um, uh, we're basically out of time, and and you know, th really appreciate everybody participating today. I want to thank Jason Mendenhall for for his time and uh, and others who joined in. David Floyer, Peter Gailey, a good friend from Dallas, Aaron Newman, Scott Lowe, Rob from New York, Jeff Kelly, uh, John Furrier. Uh, and also appreciate all the effort that was put into making this bi-coastal uh, event possible. Uh, it's not over yet. We're turning the stream over to, uh, to the SiliconANGLE studios down in Dallas at the top of the hour. They'll run News Desk for another hour, News of the Day, so watch that. At 2 p.m. East Coast time, we have a flash special, a flash cube, if you will, where we're going to continue this bi-coastal event. Uh, up on Wikibon, you'll see the... Uh, the folks that we have coming in today, uh, we've got Steve Mills, we've got uh, Brian Bukowski from Aerospike, uh, Steve Mills from IBM, of course, we've got Don Basile, uh, who's, who we've got you know, on, on video from a previous show, and we're going to be running uh, an event around flash storage, focusing on hyperscale, focusing on how enterprises are going to adopt flash, what it means for productivity, what it means for database design. That's 2 p.m. East Coast time. Watch live on siliconangle.tv. Just as a reminder, We'll have, uh, by tomorrow afternoon, up about six research notes on this call today. So please look for those. Go in, hit edit, make improvements, put up your own note. We really appreciate everybody watching uh, today. Again, thanks to, to Jason Mendenhall and everybody else who participated. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody, and thanks for being a Wikibon member. We'll see you next time. We looked at all the programs out there and identified a gap in tech news coverage. There are plenty of tech shows that provide new gadgets and talk about the latest in gaming, but those shows are just the tip of the iceberg and we're here for the deep dive. There's a difference between technology consumers and those who live the business day to day. And our viewers recognize that. The market begged for our program to fill that void. We're not just touting off headlines. Our goal is to provide you with a story, but we also want to analyze the big picture and ask the questions that no one else is asking. Our guests aren't just here to provide commentary. We work with analysts who know the industry from the inside out. The tech business isn't new, but many networks treat it as if it is, and really barely scratch the surface on technology coverage. We follow the expansion of the cloud and the evolution of big data. 
We're covering new enterprise from startup to IPO and every move in between. So what do you think was the source of this misinformation? And so you mentioned briefly uh, there are several other... If that's the case, then why does the world need another software as a service player? I like to think of us as a companion to the Cube. We're here every morning trying to extract the signal from the noise. Where the Cube excels in event coverage, we're working to bring that experience to you consistently every morning. We use the top stories of the day to provide you with breaking analysis so that you can forecast future trends. Uh, we're here before you even wake up. We're creating a fundamental change in news coverage, laying the foundation and setting the standard. And this is just the beginning.